Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself, who you are? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ilya. I'm co-founder of Near Protocol. Thank you. <laughs> co-founder of Near Protocol. So thank you again for joining me. Look, I've heard you talking. You're very passionate. And we were just talking in the background around devs and things like that. But before we jump into that, could you tell us a bit about how Near came about? What why, how, why you co-founded it? For sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, the origin story really starts... Uh, so we were actually doing another startup with my co-founder in the AI space. Uh, and uh, we built this tool to collect data, which we had people from around the world, a lot of Chinese, a lot of Russian, a lot of Ukrainian, Polish, and some people from Cuba, all worked on our platform collecting like data for us. And the problem we faced being in the US is paying them. It's just sending money into all of those countries has some problem. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and at the same time, we wanted to build, like, we believe in open source, kind of. I've been doing open source for I don't know how many years, uh, and open data. And so we were trying to actually get a kind of a market spun up, which has like all those people working on one side, and then maybe big companies funding this on the other side and creating or free data, open data for the ecosystem. And so blockchain came ar around very naturally in this case because like, oh yeah, you know, you need payments, you need coordination, you need marketplace, sounds, sounds like blockchain as a tool to solve this. And so this was like uh, maybe May 2018, so it's kind of after hype, but like, you know, it's, it sounds like there's a lot of already stuff there. So we started looking and we, start, we started to try to build stuff on Ethereum in the beginning. And it was quite hard. Like the, from perspective of developer experience, it was like very clunky. I mean, it has improved since then, but like back then it was pretty clunky. The user experience, right? Like the fact that you, you, your users need to install MetaMask because they want to do anything. They need to get some tokens first. Uh, was pretty quite hard. We actually measured like how many steps it takes for a new user to like breed a crypto kitty. Back then, it was, uh, the, it was like 32 steps oh, wow. yeah. uh, to get to that, so like from, like from scratch. And so we're like, well, that seems weird. Like, you know, we would expect if we're building this global technology, this, like a more approachable. And then being like kind of systems engineers, like I worked at Google before on like distributed systems machine learning. So we started looking at like, wait, what, what is the kind of characteristics of the systems? Like, why is it so expensive? And the, understanding was like, well, you know, it has very little capacity, it doesn't scale, and it doesn't scale for very, you know, simple reason, it's like runs on one machine, everything runs on one machine, and so, again, coming from Google, and my co-founder actually built sharded database that runs like a bunch of Fortune 500 companies, we're like, well, that seems like suboptimal, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so that's kind of how we began, it was like, and we, we looked at a bunch of other protocols as well, we didn't find anything that was kind of addressing this like usability problem, yeah while having the uh, scalability. And that's kind of how we started. It's like, well, we can actually build this. And you know, if we need this, like as developers, I'm sure there will be a bunch of other developers yeah. needing this as well. Yeah. True, true. So uh, it's been a few years. Have you seen? Almost four, yeah. Well, few, yeah, almost four. <laughs> so have you seen it from where it started, the blockchain, near to yeah. where it is now? Is it, has that Im image you had yeah. changed? and? or as new technologies that have come out kind of help the evolution of Nier? I think like we're pretty much on, I mean, we're very slower than I wanted. Like we should have launched in half a year, not in okay. two years. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, I'm very uh, optimistic. Um, but I think like from perspective of vision and, and kind of what we're trying to achieve, it's still the same. And I mean, there's like, some new technologies that are, I mean, zero knowledge obviously is super interesting. It, and back when we were starting, we were considering to look at it, but then we actually decided to not, explicitly not look at it because first of all, it wasn't ready back then at all. But second is, it's not really solving kind of the immediate problems that users have. It's a good add-on and, and so we have teams working on it to add, to compress, to, do pri to add privacy on top, but it's not solving any of the conceptual problems of like how do you achieve faster latency? How do you get, get data to users faster, right? How do you make the experience? How do you make users not be afraid of losing their keys, right? Like all of that is not really solving. There's some you know, small pieces here and there of like threshold signatures for like Edison curves that 
uh, kind of matured through the time and people are using them now. But yeah, overall, I think the vision is like empower developers to build really simple user experiences for users, yeah. and that vision is the same. So, okay, yeah, true. Okay, fair enough. And so then how, because you're very passionate about it, how have you enabled, could you share some um, words of wisdom of how you've enabled the devs to, I mean, to do that? I mean, so from the start, like, so the, the, the kind of, we 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 we, turn, we we wanted to build like and launch in like eight months. That was that was a plan, right? That was very optimistic. But what we did build was a developer experience. So we actually had a developer experience after six months, which it I mean it improved a lot to be clear. But it it kind of conceptually stayed the same. So we built the virtual machine using WebAssembly with the runtime. We had this original kind of understanding that if you want to scale all applications need to kind of run in parallel, right? And so, like, they may be running on the same computer physically, but it should not matter to developer. And so, like, as a developer, you should only think about your applications and communicating with other apps uh, kind of through message passing, which is actually very similar how if you think of, like, traditional finance or, or web application channels, it's microservices, right? It's all microservices sending messages to each other. So this is the same concept. And then using WebAssembly allowed us to actually have Rust, you can have C++, you can have, uh, at the point when we started, we had a thing called assembly script, which compiled TypeScript to WebAssembly. Okay. And so we kind of gave ability for people who don't know anything about blockchain to start playing with it. Yeah. And that was like pretty powerful, but I think it, it was still missing the mark. And the benefit is we're actually launching tomorrow full JavaScript support. Oh, is it? So okay. every, yeah, like any JavaScript you can come up with that doesn't use like window, like DOM yeah. or, or file system can run in smart contract on there. And so, so that actually opens up like this, this kind of conceptual thing that we wanted, which is like any developer can come in with whatever language they want and just build stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then on top of it, you have the tools, you have like the standards, you have like all of the things that people expect, right? Like we need to have that kind of figured out and it needs to be simple, accessible, you know, standard library example. Um, and so just building that out, like building a stack like that. And that's kind of in a way, because that was like the experience was already there. So we had time to build all the tooling while we build the blockchain, yeah, okay. right? So and blockchain took like, again, way more, way longer than we expected, right? It's hard. <laughs> yes. It's way harder than we expected to. I mean, we were a little bit cocky when we started. But that it enabled like, to mature this experience. Like, we have CLIs, we have tooling, we have APIs, we have you know, like, servers that can like, cache stuff, we have you know, indexers that can you know, pipe data, like, all of the tooling that like, you would expect and you know, Ethereum has, and that's why it been, like, became way more mature. Like we have that as well, and it's like runs on WebAssembly, so you have this ability to run. And so, example was because of this, we had we we had a project like Aurora, which is taking EVM, like literally pulling out piece of code from Ethereum and just running it as smart contract on there. Oh, and it okay, was like yeah. that kind of easy, right? I mean, obviously there's a lot of work to make fully compatible, yeah. but like that kind of conceptually idea is you take existing piece of code and just run it. And similarly, the JavaScript is actually taking existing JavaScript VM implementation from, from the internet, right? I mean, making sure it's valid and secure and just run it on, inside near. Okay. And so that kind of is like the power that you want to give developers, right? It's like you can just take existing code, mash it in the way you want, and just run it and give it to users. And then in turn, the users should be able to use the stuff without thinking about blockchain, without thinking about sharding, without thinking about like what the, whatever weird stuff you have decided to build there, right? And that's where we have you know account model. So my account is like ilia.near, right? And it has different keys for different devices, for different applications, for different access management. So you have like this model that kind of completely different than what the regularly blockchains do. But what it enables is like more security, more ability, like you can rotate keys, right? Hey, like this wallet has something insecure, rotate keys, boom. Oh, okay. Don't need yeah, to move yeah, all your yeah, assets yeah, yeah. and figure out like, yeah, what yeah. if you have some royalties, like yeah. plugged in for this account and this you key lose is it compromised. With the wallet because, okay, yeah. okay. You yeah. can rotate keys, you can have a one-time key that a single, like another person can send a single transaction. So we can have a, like I can send you a link that even if you don't have a near wallet, you can click on it and redeem some NFTs or some near or some stable coin. Right, so you can actually send money or, or assets or even data to people who don't have an account on near yet, which is actually 
better than Web2. This is the only thing, like in Web2, you cannot send money to someone who doesn't have a bank account yeah. or who doesn't have a Venmo account. Yeah. Here, you can send money to people who don't have any accounts. They will sign up, register, start, start, getting, like, start playing and interacting with the system. And so these types of experiences you can build right, through this kind of, like, it is a different model, but then it allows you to build simpler experiences. Yeah, OK, wow, fascinating. Now, really fascinating. I, I'm learning a lot myself as well. So uh, one question, finally, to close us off. Interoperability, what's your views on it? I've been, you know, you stick to social media, I've seen a few posts, I'm keen to get insights on you. How do you see blockchains evolving a few in existence, interoperability, uh, interoperability being a key? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely a key, and we actually invested in the bridge back in 19. Mm. We started building Rainbow Bridge, and we went a little bit overboard, as usual. We were like, well, we're going to build the most trustless bridge with the, mo the hardest network, which is Ethereum. Yes. And so it took a while. <laughs> right? And so, so, we built, so Rainbow Bridge is the only one trustless bridge connected to Ethereum. Okay. Like it's IBC style, like client verification. It has multiple levels of like, like modules, which allow you to actually like permissionlessly compose new types of applications. It, you can read the state of the other chain. Yep. So you have a full kind of like, you know, message passing communication, whatever you want to build. And so obviously like it makes sense to do that with other chains, but I think like even beyond that, and I started talking about this like a few weeks ago, is there's a kind of next wave I think is coming. And the next wave, I call it remote accounts. This is the idea that as a user, you actually don't really care as much where application is. Like I don't really care if application is on Near or on Ethereum or whatever if I can just use it, right? And so the idea of these remote accounts is that you can actually go to application, log in with whatever wallet you have, right? Is this a MetaMask on Ethereum? Fine. If it's a you know, Phantom on Solana, it's whatever, like some random wallet, maybe Bitcoin wallet, doesn't matter. I mean, caveats, but, but the idea is, is that. And then with that, you can start interacting with an app. What it does underneath is it actually it does message passing with the, with the chain that you're on where your assets are, but it actually, whatever you do on the application, it gets recorded with your account that your wallet is. So for example, imagine this is near and you connect it with MetaMask from Ethereum and you bought an NFT, right? So what's gonna happen is it will bridge, it, it, you will send a transaction on Ethereum that will bridge some assets and exchange them and, and communicate directly with an app on Near, buy NFT, and NFT will belong to you, but on Near. It will not bridge NFT back. Because bridging NFT doesn't really work very well. So, but what will happen is the front end will show you that you own this NFT because it's actually under your account, just on Near. Yes. And so, so you need kind of an aggregation level that aggregates from all the chains to your actual account that you logged in. But like which chain it's on, I mean, it can show you like a logo or whatever, but it doesn't really matter for the user. I mean, if you trust the, the, yes. the, the chains you're on. And so through that, you can kind of abstract a lot of the chain stuff, right? That right now you're like, as a user, I, I need to bridge first, swap, you know, do this, log in, create a new wallet, install a new extension, right? Like we can actually abstract all that and create kind of a, like whatever wallets and chains users want to have assets on, and then whatever the, applications want to build their data on and then just kind of map it all into one space. And so there is a lot of pieces that need to come together, but like we already see some of the stuff happening. Like on near there's some applications that work like that yeah. already where you just log in with whatever wall like with whatever wall in theory and you bridge assets directly to the app and then you trade or interact there and then you bridge out. Yeah. And so I think that is kind of where the interoperability is going is like kind of making it less needed to think which chain it's on as much as more of like, I want to use this application, I'm using it, I don't want to use this application, I'm done. Yeah, no, excellent, no, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been oh, yeah. fantastic, very insightful. I can see, um, yeah, you're very layered into the detail, <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's, it was a I have, I have a one hour whiteboard series about all the stuff. Was very, it, it, there's a three layers and then in each layer there's more layers, so yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love, love yeah. it, love it. Thank you for uh, coming awesome. on the show. Yeah, thanks.